Okay, pardon me for shooting from the hip here, but uh, with recent events in um, the Ukraine, naturally there's a lot of people that are talking about Eurasianism in the mode of Alexander Dugin and all of that kind of thing. <clears throat> I haven't read enough Dugin to be able to comment intelligently on that. I've only read uh, Political Platonism, although... Uh, his book on multipolarity is on my to-read list. However, what I can contribute is a discussion of Atlanticism and the roots of the understanding of where the Atlantic strategy comes from, why it developed the way that it did, and why it's in direct opposition to Atlanticism, uh, in direct opposition to Eurasianism and multipolarity. Okay. I'll try and do this in order of time. So let's wind all of the way back. Um, and if we zoom in here to the United Kingdom. Um, there's an old problem in uh, geopolitics, which is how much energy should a person devote to uh, the navy and how much to the army? How much money should a state spend on the army and how much should it spend on the navy? Okay, during the age of empires, we saw states spending a lot on both France, Spain, Portugal, Portugal, if I, I think this is right, spent mostly on a navy. Spain spent a lot on both. France also spent a lot on both. Germany spent mostly on army, a little bit on navy. Prussia spent almost entirely, if not entirely, on the army and uh, very little on the navy. Why, why, why is that? It's because these countries, France and Germany and Prussia, have land borders, so they need an army in order to be able to defend those land borders. Okay, now let's take the counter position. The United Kingdom uh, spent almost all of its money on navy. Now you might say, well hold on, I thought the British army was also um, you know, well invested in and did a lot of work all around the world as part of the British Empire. Yes, that's a fair point. Um, but let me dig in a little on that. It was only once the empire was starting to get established in the United Kingdom. Well, it was only once the United Kingdom was so wealthy that it was able to afford both a navy and an army that it invested a lot in its army. That That's my proposition. I fully admit that I'm wrong. If you know better, please tell me. For the United Kingdom, a higher priority is to spend on the navy. Why? Because it doesn't have any land borders, it only has a naval border. So, in the history of wars between France and England, of which there are many, why did it make sense for the United Kingdom to spend money on a navy? Because if France tried to send an, an army, the United Kingdom could just sink it, because it has to get on boats to travel there, right? Now this is not a sophisticated analysis, I fully grant you that, but I just want to cover this ground in order to be able to kind of do this uh, background because it will be very enlightening as we uh, come into the 20th century. So that being the case, now that we've established this dichotomy, do we spend on navy or do we spend on army, and we've seen that the United Kingdom spends on navy, let's accelerate into the 20th century. Okay, what is the, what does it imply for the United Kingdom that they spend on a navy? Well, it means that there's a major problem, which is that if all, it gives them an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is that so long as Europe remains divided, no individual country will be able to get enough financial investment to be able to create a powerful enough navy to be able to secure a sea route to the United Kingdom and have enough money as well to be able to afford an army in order to be able to 
take over the United Kingdom. So what does this imply strategically? It means it's in the United Kingdom's interest to always make sure that Europe remains divided against itself because any political entity that was a, would have been able to unify France, Germany, Poland and Spain or let's say France, Germany and Poland, right? Um, and then you can add on any single one of Spain, Italy or Russia, whatever you... The, whichever countries you think are required in order to make that possible, right? Then they would be able to subject England. This is the reason why historically we always see England intervening in wars on the continent on the side of the um, side that is losing because they always want to try and maintain a balance of power of states against each other. Whereas usually what would we what would we would expect from an orthodox strategic angle is you always join the side that is going to win, right? And this is a direct um, contravention of that principle, but for good reason. Now this also explains the United Kingdom's behaviour inside the European Union when it was a member of the European Union, of essentially just trying to keep all of the states divided from each other. And this is why the why we can make the argument that the European Union that the United Kingdom leaving the European Union makes the European Union stronger. There's also some ways in which it makes it weaker. But in in, one, in this sense in particular, one of the kind of internal wreckers of the attempt to unify economically the European continent has left. Okay. If you accept my analysis so far, then I put it to you following the sort of naval theories of um, naval theorists like Mackinder and Mahan that almost exactly the same argumentation can be made uh, let me get the map out so that we can look at it flat almost exactly the same argument can be made about the United States' approach to Eurasia if we look at the continents which ones are capable of being united uh, under a single political structure well the United States is united under a single political structure okay Mexico and Canada are not theoretically part of the United States but they are integrated into the economic system um, it's a little bit shaky but if you'll just grant me that the United States is broadly speaking uh, the North American continent is broadly speaking unified under a um, single political entity or at the very least there are no viable powers that can challenge the United States for control of the North Atlantic uh, for the North American continent. Now let's look at the other uh, continents just to kind of do a rundown. Okay, South America is politically undivided and not unifiable. Africa is politically uh, politically divided and ununifiable. Antarctica, there's nobody there. Australia is unified under a single political entity, but um, due to the sparse kind of viable living conditions, even given its large natural resources, um, it doesn't have the ability to become a great power on its own, right? Then there's the Indian subcontinent, which has been, um, to a degree, politically unified, give or take Pakistan and Bangladesh. Okay, so what Mackinder and Mahan argued is that if a, a single political entity was capable of unifying the entirety of Eurasia underneath its control, it would be able to exploit resources of such incredible power that it would be the one entity that would be capable of being economically more powerful than the United States. This is why the United States constantly attempts to make sure that Eurasia always remains divided. That was the reason why they entered Vietnam under the principle of the um, prevention of communism spreading over the entirety of Eurasia because they were scared that if Russia and China um, unified and 
India was a little bit kind of half and half because of the whole non-aligned movement and all of that. If they also joined, and remember at this time that the United Soviet Socialist Republics owned half of the European continent as well, then the, you know you can see how just a little bit of expansion would be enough to bring their worst fears into reality. Now, as a matter of fact, those fears ended up being unfounded because China and Russia were never actually that unified with each other. Um, and this is why China was able to be brought under, brought on site um, in the special deal in the 20th century um, when... Um, who's the guy that said I'm not a crook you know the, pre the president at that time went to China anyway um, and managed to kind of flip them onto the US side um, so the point that I'm trying to make is this is the fundamental logic of the Atlanticist movement that so long as the and this is the, and this is also the basis of the quote unquote special relationship so long as the U United Kingdom can keep uh, Europe divided and the United States can keep Eurasia divided those two strategic approaches are perfectly in line with each other and this is what has led people to say if the United Kingdom it doesn't have permanent allies only permanent interests well we can say a similar thing about the United States in relation to Eurasia right um okay so how does multipolarity threaten that well, the basis of the United States' power in the world, uh, not including the nuclear element at the moment, is exactly the same as the United Kingdom's power in relation to uh, Europe. It's naval. Because most of the world is covered in water, most of the world is um, able to be won on the basis of naval power. Now, because the United States has been able to use its naval power to um, keep itself safe, and just to remind you here, the United States has um, a row of mountains running down both sides, a massive moat on either side, and a big bit in the middle that grows um, huge amounts of food, and also is economically supplemented by its massive um, river network that makes uh, the economy strong because it's cheap to ship things. The, uh, I'm just repeating Peter Zion's argument here. I don't deserve any credit for this, right? I'm basically just repeating other theorists' ideas. Um, so that being the case, that allows the United States to politically unify, then they can become rich, then they can afford both a navy and an army, which means they can have an expeditionary force, which means they can maintain a world order because they can go places and have wars there. Please keep in mind I am not making any moral arguments inside this video. I am only talking about the strategic reasons that people are doing things. Um, you can feel free to say that's good or that's evil or whatever. That's, I don't care. Okay. So how does multipolarity threaten the US world order? From the perspective of an Atlanticist or Eurasianist um you could argue that it doesn't. If other states are um, merely promoting their own cultures, Russia, China, Brazil, India, and attempting to become their own sort of um, great powers, but none of them are becoming actual superpowers that can threaten the United States, they gain spheres of influence inside their own regional zones. To what degree does that threaten the Atlanticist strategy. Well, you could make the argument that it doesn't, but I would put it to you that in, if any of these countries were, was able to do that, then they would be, a, be getting close to being able to unify their economies in a way that would start being able to gain enough wealth, and this is exactly what we've seen happen in China, that now very either, depending on how you see things, already or very soon, China will be able to deny the United States access to its near abroad, uh, oceanically speaking, what we call the first island chain, Yellow Sea, East China Sea, South China Sea, right? And if they do that, that means that the United States is 
still broadly has control of most of the world's oceans, but is being challenged there, and therefore, because they're challenged in the naval area, can't land their land expeditionary forces, and therefore don't have the ability to impose their will on everyone around the world, or at least in any place where they're navally speaking denied, um, and keep in mind that any battle that occurs near the coasts of foreign powers gets supported by land powers in the form of, you know, cru like land-launched cruise missiles and that kind of thing. Okay. So, therefore, I put it to you that the Eurasianist and multipolar um, strategic order is a threat to the Atlanticist order, and this is why we see the United States pursuing a counter-Eurasianist or counter-multipolar order strategy. Um, I would be especially I would be especially thankful if someone who's educated in uh, Eurasianist uh, theory. Um, or Duganism could respond to this and let me know what mistakes I've made um, because I want to clarify my thought on this issue. Okay, thank you.